All right, let's go ahead and get started. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Glover, and I'm the CEO of LISC, and I am very pleased to be here today to join you for the Rural Seminar. Um, so first of all, uh, thanks again for joining us. We're launching now a little bit different format. This is the 2022 LISC Rural Talks on the Hill series. Today, we're gonna be talking mostly about broadband and infrastructure uh, investment, but this is the first of a series of three, so we're really happy to have you here. And if you're joining us online, Wherever you may be out in cyberspace, we're happy to have you out there too. So first of all, I do want to say some thanks. Uh, Rural Talks was made possible by Wells Fargo, who is our title sponsor and a very longtime partner in community and economic development across both rural and urban communities. So thank you, Wells, very much for making this seminar possible and also for your very longstanding partnership and for your commitment to rural America. So today's event is quite reflective of LISC's commitment to forging connections, conversation, and collaboration. And that's all aimed at amplifying the voices of the communities that we serve. Those are the communities that are underserved or unheard in our country. And as the CEO of LISC, I can assure you that we always have been and we will remain committed to strengthening those voices. Um, and we do that through specific initiatives. One is Project 10X, which specifically focuses on doubling down on investments in communities of color um, and finding solutions to bridge America's health, wealth, and opportunity gaps. Uh, but we've also made a rural promise. And that promise is to make a more uh, specifically targeted and direct investments and programming targeted at rural and underserved uh, remote regions. And the rural program has always been a huge focus of LISC and we love this program and it's what makes us unique. Um, it's, it's really what LISC is made of, the fabric of LISC is in the rural program. So the pandemic, as we know, uh, and the corresponding years of disconnect, we're still a little bit disconnected here today, uh, really underscored the longstanding disparities that still exist in, in rural America, particularly around broadband investment and digital skilling. It's still there, and we saw it uh, with children having to stay home um, and do their schooling, with people having to stay home and do their work. Rural communities suffered disproportionately with the lack of broadband. Um, so today, we're going to focus on those challenges of the challenges of connecting rural America with essential utilities like broadband. And we're gonna hear directly from our community members, which is so important for us to hear their voices. We're also gonna hear from public and corporate leaders who have a vision um, and are starting out on journeys to help better bridge that digital divide in the rural communities. So wherever you may be, whether you're at home or you're here, pull up your chair, get yourself a big cup of coffee because it's gonna be a long day um, and enjoy today's Rural Talks broadband seminar. And so with that, I would like to welcome the uh, LISC's Vice President of Rural to the stage, Caitlin Kane. Thank you, Lisa, and good morning, everybody. Woo, we made it. We're almost here. Though we are a hybrid event this year, we are we are baby steps to hopefully one day getting back to our full in-person rural seminar series. But I can't thank you enough for joining us this morning. It is absolutely wonderful to see humans and to have this human to human connection. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come out this morning. And for those of you who are joining us online, thank you so much for continuing to stay with us through this remote environment. We actually have today about uh, 75 folks with us joining us in the room and online just north of about 400 registrants, really all eager to talk about broadband and infrastructure investment in rural America. So it is incredible to see the enthusiasm and support for this work continue to grow. As Lisa had mentioned earlier, Rural Talks on the Hill is actually a three-part series. So today, of course, we're talking broadband and infrastructure, but we're going to come back two other times this year. We'll be back in July talking about housing investment, and then again in December talking about small business and workforce development opportunities. So stay with us throughout the year. There is a lot to talk about when it comes to rural investment. And thank you so much for your, your ongoing support 
and your enthusiasm as we continue to champion all this work for our rural communities. But uh, some brief housekeeping issues for all of our friends that are joining us online. To the 400 plus so registrants online, just a few things to note. If you are having any trouble navigating the VFAIRS platform, there is a little red icon on the left bottom portion of your screen. Click on that icon and a little bubble will pop up. There'll be a chat feature and that individual will be able to walk you through any issues you might have. If you are having challenges with that for whatever reason, please reach out directly to members of the Rule List team, and we'd be happy to provide some additional support. We have a cadre uh, of folks in the back of the room here constantly monitoring the VFAIRS platform, and so we're, we're here to help. Also, there's a chat feature associated with the VFAIRS platform. Please enter any questions you may have about uh, for any of our speakers at any point in time through that chat feature. We have a number of our uh, representatives of the rural team also at the back of the house right now who will be monitoring the chat continuously throughout the seminar and can respond to you directly through the chat and also share out to, to any of the speakers. So don't hesitate to, to ask a, a lot of questions. And then finally, I know my uh, director of communications, Tiffany, would have my head if I did not specifically call out the, the need to follow us on social media. Um, please use the hashtag rural talks throughout the seminar series. Please like us on the various social platforms. We will do the same for you, but let's continue to have this conversation online as we are in person. So with that, it is my distinct pleasure to actually introduce our sponsor, Tim Rios from Wells Fargo Bank. And Tim is the Senior Vice President for Wells Fargo Rule, Social Impact and Sustainable, Sustainability Group. Tim is actually a 23 year veteran of Wells Fargo and has held numerous positions throughout the corporation throughout that time. But most importantly, for those of you who do not know Tim, Tim is an incredibly special human being. He is incredibly humble and exceedingly committed to rural investment. He has done yeoman's work in terms of making the connections and doing the deep dive to ensure that organizations are really getting connected with the resources and the amplification of their voice is being heard in a manner that really resonates and resonates in a very sustaining way. Uh, so it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to all of you today, Tim Rios from Wells Fargo Bank. Good morning. Okay, wow, that was such a nice introduction. Thank you, Kate. That really meant a lot to me. I appreciate that. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, again. And my name is uh, Tim Rios, and I have the pleasure of leading a Wells Fargo strategy for rural and native communities. And before I start with some formal remarks, I just want to recognize Eileen Stenerson from our team. Eileen, thank you. Great to see you. And I think this is the first time maybe we've met in person. And I've been now with Wells Fargo for 25 years this year. And, uh, and, you know, because of, of uh, the pandemic and everything else, it's such a pleasure, not just that you're here, but also that you are on the advisory board for Rural Lisk and the work that you do there. Thank you for that. Uh, it's early in the event, but I don't think it's too early to wish Kate and her talented team and all of you a very successful seminar. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Lisk and Rural Lisk all of my career, but it's only the last uh, year that I've had an opportunity to get like Kate said, a, more of a deep dive into the work of rural risk. Um, it's a very large country, but through, it, through its efforts and partners in many states, rural risk does an extraordinary job of lifting up people who are often overlooked, especially families in or near native reservations and those living in persistent poverty areas. So many thanks to LISC. At Wells Fargo, we've been looking for rural community, we've been working with rural communities for as long as I can remember, and actually since 1852 when we were founded. Today, Wells Fargo has more than, uh, more small uh, branches in small rural communities than any other large financial institution, close to 400. I grew up in one of those, uh, Delray, California, present population today is about 1,200, actually 1,246, I looked this morning, so it's grown a little bit. Uh, and in 2021, Wells Fargo began an even more focused approach in working with these communities. And since that time, we've made more than a dozen large and deliberate investments to support housing affordability, small business, 
financial health, and climate efforts. One of our earliest successes was being the first to fund a radio station in Alaska that was seeing its tower and antenna sink into the ground. And that was, you know, that was one that was brought to us from people in the field. And that station plays a critical role in helping some of the most remote villages get information that they need in their daily lives. So I'm excited to say that since that initial investment, the organization now has now raised every penny necessary for their important work. So uh, great job to that organization. I'm sure they had a lot of work ahead of them after that initial support from Wells Fargo. Just today, I'm excited to let you know that soon, Wells Fargo and Rural Lisp will work together to bring more access uh, and information and capital through an exciting pilot focused on improving the financial prospects of small communities. Everything is harder in rural America, and that includes access to reliable or any internet service and digital financial tools. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag today, as Kate knows, although I really would like to. Uh, but please stay tuned for news of this exciting work in the next couple of months when we'll activate something in rural America. Kate, thank you for your tremendous leadership. And many thanks to your amazing team as well, especially Nadia Villagran, with whom I've had the pleasure to work. She's one of the most thoughtful, talented professionals I've come to know and the champion for rural families. So best of luck with this event. And uh, I just want to also say that what a pleasure, Lisa, it was getting to know you this morning. Also from a small town of 12,000, Boone, Iowa. And uh, I was just suggesting that I, I'd like to start some action to have a street there named after Lisa because she has such a remarkable career. Thank you. Uh, have a great morning and a great seminar. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you so much, Tim. We, uh, again, are absolutely thrilled with the partnership that we have with Wells Fargo and so looking forward to talking more about what that partnership will be with Rural Lisk. So to all of our partners and stakeholder groups out there, please stay tuned. We'll be following up uh, very shortly in, in the coming weeks and the coming months with additional information about this program. But we promise you it will be definitely worth checking in and, and chatting with us more about. So with this, it is also my distinct honor and privilege to introduce a, a brief video from actually my former mayor of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu, who is now serving as the White House Senior Advisor and Infrastructure Implementation Coordinator. Mitch is going to share a brief video really highlighting the Biden administration's strategic investment for rural communities and what this really means for so many of you in the audience today, both in person and virtually. So with that, let's roll the video. Hi, I'm Mitch Landrieu, the Infrastructure Implementation Coordinator and Senior Advisor to the President here at the White House. Thank you all for being here as part of a very important conversation around investing in our rural communities across the country. We are so grateful to Rural Lisk for pulling this conversation together. As all of you know, rural communities are the backbone of our nation. They feed and they fuel America, securing our energy independence and our food supply. Rural communities are home to the beautiful places we all depend on for recreation and home to more than a third of our nation's military. For too long, rural communities have been left out and have been left behind. The success of rural America is a personal priority for President Biden. It's part of why he pushed for the bipartisan infrastructure law. This law is a once in a generation opportunity to expand affordable high speed internet to every home and business across rural America, to build new roads and bridges that are safe to use for our families, to deliver economic opportunity to all Americans. The president believes that when rural America succeed, we all succeed. Building a better America means that no community can be left behind. It means that every American has the opportunity to build a good life without needing to leave the community that they call home. The bipartisan infrastructure law includes specific dedicated funding for rural and underserved areas. This funding will guarantee affordable high-speed internet in every home and business linking rural communities to jobs, precision agriculture, distance learning, telemedicine, and so much more. It will make it easier to access mental health and substance abuse services. And by making these investments, we will also eliminate lead pipes, 
provide clean and safe drinking water and basic sanitation, build safe roads and bridges, improve access to transit and rural mobility, upgrade the locks and the dams and the waterways that move goods to market, secure our electric grid, build up our communities so that they can withstand natural disasters like drought, hurricanes, wildfires, and tornadoes, create jobs by cleaning up abandoned wells and mines, and preserve public lands and outdoor recreation opportunities for the next generation of Americans. These investments will bring good paying jobs and economic opportunity to rural America. You see, President Biden believes we will grow the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. This only works in partnership with rural community leaders like you. We are so grateful to rural list partners gathered here today who are making significant investments in rural communities across the country. We look forward to our continued work together to build a better America. Thank you all so much. Getting my workout today, the up and the down. But thank you so much, Mitch, for those great uh, comments on rural connectivity. I think it's incredibly important to underscore the importance of infrastructure investment from this administration in, in these rural communities. I actually had the, the privilege and the honor yesterday to attend one of the White House events on talking about the rollout of the ACP program, which is the affordability program for internet connection. Uh, for those of you who are not as aware uh, of this program, essentially this will uh, really make internet connection affordable and accessible to rural and urban communities alike, but primarily for all those rural communities where internet connection has had a challenge in terms of being too costly, too inaccessible. So this is just a real uh, incredible moment in time where we're really doubling down on our commitment across the country to so many of these communities, especially in rural America. Um, so thank you to everyone that has been part of, of making that feasible and bringing those resources to bear. To our stakeholder groups that are also joining us virtually, if you are interested in uh, understanding more of the resources that are available to rural communities throughout this initiative, you can actually seek more information at the White House website and by also viewing the, the rural playbook. So to talk a little bit more about federal resources and federal policy in particular, I am actually going to invite uh, Matt Joseph to the stage. Matt Joseph is our Senior Vice President at LISC in charge of federal policy. And with that, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Kate. Good morning, everybody. Um, so as Kate mentioned, we wanted to kind of spend a few minutes setting the table, talk a little about uh, the, uh, the infrastructure bill that uh, Mr. Landry just, uh, just referenced. And it really kind of gives you some more context for the rest of the, uh, the event. Uh, today and tomorrow, uh, you'll be hearing from practitioners and government officials that have been engaged in implementing uh, this once in a generation investment in our nation's infrastructure. So I just wanted to kind of give a brief overview of some of the key elements of the legislation. So this legislation passed in November of 2021. Uh, it was a $1.2 trillion uh, uh, bill, the, Inf the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and a lot of people just call it the bipartisan uh, infrastructure law. And it will direct $550 billion of new funding um, to modernize America's physical infrastructure needs. Uh, the funding supports a host of investments, including rebuilding ports, roads, bridges, rails, uh, expanding access to clean drinking water, uh, building climate resilient infrastructure and advancing environmental justice, and uh, of course, broadband infrastructure and access. Uh, I want to focus uh, these remarks on three kind of key provisions of the legislation, three kind of focus areas that I really think will speak a lot to the participants here and, and that are uh, uh, listening remotely. Uh, the first is investments in digital equity and inclusion. Uh, the second is the, uh, the new authorization of the Minority Business Development Agency. And the third is just the, the overall investments in our rural communities. Uh, so I'm going to begin with the digital equity components of this. Uh, we all know that digital inclusion is a critical piece of community and economic development, intersecting with nearly every aspect of life, from health, education, workforce development, job training, support for small businesses, and even in affordable housing. You, you, know, you really have to have a strong internet uh, to really participate in all, in all aspects of, of, of health and wealth and growth. 
And the disparate impacts of the pandemic brought internet access really to the forefront of the national conversation. Uh, we've now come to better understand how we and our community-based partners must be a part of the solution to address the dig digital divide. Uh, it's, it's estimated that up to 42 million people in the U.S. still lack access to high-speed internet. Uh, and we know this disparity disproportionately impacts tribal, low-income, and rural communities. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law recognized a broad consensus in Washington that building resilient communities necessitates investments in really three aspects of digital inclusion. One is the affordable, robust broadband internet options to be able to access the services. The second is widely uh, available and enabled devices and equipment that meet users' needs. And the third is access to digital literacy, training, technical support. The new infrastructure law aims to advance digital equity by first increasing funding for existing programs like the Tribal Connect Connectivity Broadband Program, an additional $2 billion to support those efforts. And then it established four new initiatives. Uh, the first is the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, also called BEAD. Over $42 billion invested in this program. It's a block grant uh, administered at Department of Commerce, NTIA, uh, for, so for the states to really uh, get, the, uh, get the infrastructure for broadband, particularly into rural communities. Uh, the second is the Affordable Connectivity Program that Kate just referenced, $14 billion. And this is a new program, but it uh, really replaces the existing Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. So it helps ensure households can afford the, uh, the high quality internet services. Uh, and just the other day, the administration announced commitments to scale the impact of this program they, with 20 leading internet providers who cover more than 80% of the U.S. population uh, agreeing to offer services at no more than $30 a month. So that, that's a huge announcement that just came out, uh, and that relates to the uh, ACP program. A third uh, new initiative in the uh, uh, legislation was the State Digital Equity Capacity Grant Program, $1.5 billion that will support states. So this is for states to, uh, in the planning and expanding capacity to deliver digital inclusion programs. And there's also a national initiative, $1.25 billion uh, for digital inclusion, all this at NTIA at the Department of Commerce. So there was a huge commitment in the legislation to really expanding broadband uh, uh, support. Um, so I think that's one, one exciting piece. A second piece I, I mentioned was uh, minority business development. Um, the, uh, we were really excited, LISC has advocated for this, and we we're really excited to see it picked up in the bipartisan infrastructure law, the authorization and expansion of the Minority Business Development Agency, which is really the only federal agency solely dedicated to the growth and support of minority-owned businesses. Uh, it previously operated under an executive order, so it was really long overdue in getting properly authorized. Uh, so the highlights of this reauthorization include $110 million of annual funding authorizations, which is a significant increase over the current levels of $48 million. And I will, as an advocate, pause to say just because something's authorized doesn't mean it gets funded. Uh, so we need to try to support Congress in funding uh, up to that $110 million. Um, the, it also substantially increased the agency's geographic reach through the establishment of a rural minority business development center. Uh, allowing MBDA, MBDA to create rural business centers, partnering with historically black colleges and universities. So that's an exciting new initiative. And uh, a third thing that was really exciting about the authorization is the, uh, the new authority for them to partner with nonprofits outside of the traditional minority business development center structure to support business counseling and capital access for minority businesses. So there's a, there's a lot of great tools now available in the full reauthorization, like I said, was long overdue. And the third piece of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the legislation was broadly the community infrastructure piece that, that uh, Mr. Landrieu was referencing, uh, more robust investments uh, in the physical infrastructure that we depend on for connected, healthy, and safe environments, uh, investing in underserved communities, including $55 billion for clean drinking water, the largest investment in American history, uh, $21 billion to the EPA to support brownfield revitalizations and super, uh, Superfund cleanups, uh, and increasing funds to improve transportation options in rural and remote areas. Uh, and I would say that a lot of these investments are going to have an outweighed influence in rural communities. Uh, I'd really encourage folks to look, the White House put out a document called the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Rural Playbook. Um, and it really is like a, a what 
how do we do it, where, how can we apply for these dollars? It really pulls into one place, really how these uh, investments are gonna be supporting uh, rural communities. So we're really excited to see that that legislation pass for all these uh, for all these reasons and programs. And I would definitely encourage you again. It's the bipartisan infrastructure law rural playbook. Um, with that, I'm going to take a transition now and uh, and invite up to the stage uh, Assistant Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development uh, Alejandro Castillo. As head of the EDA, the assistant, oh yeah, let me do my spiel first before the applause. Uh, as head of the EDA, uh, Assistant Secretary Castillo is responsible for fulfilling the Bureau's mission of leading the federal economic development agenda, uh, including uh, uh, billions of, of recently authorized dollars for COVID relief uh, that's, that I'm sure is keeping her on her toes. Uh, but she's an experienced public administrator who previously served as the National Director of the Department of Commerce's Minority Business Development Agency. Uh, so I'm sure you're as thrilled as we are to see that permanently authorized now. And she held senior policy positions at the White House and the International Trade Administration. She was confirmed by a unanimous vote for this position. So there is still some bipartisanship in this town, and, uh, uh, but they know a good thing when they, when they see it, I guess, Alejandra. Um, so I'm very, very pleased to welcome her to the stage, Alejandra Castillo. Well, good morning. <clears throat> My apologies, the uh, Washington allergies will get you at some point in your, in your career here at NDC. Matt, thank you so much for the introduction, greatly appreciate it. And, um, and it was great to see Mitch Landrew. Um, if there's somebody you need to watch, it's Mitch Landrew. He is definitely not only um, uh, overseeing the infrastructure bill, uh, infrastructure law, but is definitely making sure that not only are we thinking about infrastructure, not the way we did it in the 1950s, where we connected, but we also divided. We want to make sure that this infrastructure law connects us and unites us. So I'm very grateful to Rural Lisk. Um, I'm a big fan of Lisk, have been for many, many years. And I have prepared remarks, but I also want to take a moment because there's just so much richness here. Um, First of all, congratulations that you're back in person. There's nothing uh, great than to be able to speak to your colleagues, to exchange ideas, to not only witness what's happening. I've been in Washington, D.C. for 30 years. Don't ask me why, but it's true. But I believe in government. I really believe in government. I, I'm a public servant at heart. And it is exciting times. I am. It's, it's incredible to think, to speak about an infrastructure law that took over 25 years and we're actually talking about it, not in hypotheticals or in this like distant future, but as in right now, that is a moment of excitement. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because we have the opportunity to be the architects of the future. And there's nothing greater than to be at the forefront of what's happening right now. So I know that today we're going to be talking about broadband. And there's nothing right now in my mind to spur economic development than to make sure that every community, every community has access to broadband. So I'll talk a bit about broadband and what EDA is doing, but I want to give you a little bit of a primer, right? Having been in DC for 30 years, you know, we throw out a lot of acronyms. I mean, this is the, the capital of acronyms. We throw out a lot of funding opportunities, but we all know that going after government grants is not for the faint of heart. You know, we all know that it's, it's hard to navigate the federal government. Even with three decades, I'm still figuring out who's doing what, where, and how. So I wanna give you a bit of a primer as to the Department of Commerce because I think it's going to enlighten you in terms of how does this all connect? So commerce is anywhere between 13 to 16 different bureaus. And today you're hearing about EDA, the Economic Development Administration, which I have the great pleasure to oversee and to work with incredible colleagues. And I'm gonna call two of them, Courtney Haynes, who's right here, who's our coal community coordinator, as well as Sam Marcus, who's here as well. But there are so many different colleagues at EDA. We have six different regional offices. 
And please connect with us, eda.gov, all these different regional offices. In turn, we have people on the ground who work as um, economic regional specialists. So these are the individuals that you should be connecting with uh, at any time. But if you don't connect with them, please connect with me. And I give out my email all the time and very few people actually use it, but my email is very simple, acastillo at eda.gov. I may not respond immediately, but I'll respond at 3 a.m. when I'm suffering from insomnia. But here's why I wanna give you this little bit of a primer in terms of commerce. So I spoke about EDA. You're going to be hearing about NTIA, National Telecommunication and Information Agency, which by the way, is managing $42 billion, anywhere between 42, $48 billion right now focusing on broadband. But commerce is also NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And we're all being impacted by climate change, whether it's hurricanes and, and tornadoes and droughts and fires. So NOAA is really essential at the core of what commerce is doing. Commerce is also MBDA, Minority Business Development Agency. And one thing that we also know is that rural America is not homogeneous. There's a lot of complexities and diversity and we have to also lift that up. Commerce is also international trade administrations. So think about it. Everything we produce and export, 96% of the world's consumers live outside of the US. So when we talk about rural America, we're also talking about our exporting opportunities. Commerce is also National Institute of Standards and Technology. So when we think about innovation and technology and, and the way we build things, that's NIST. So I can go on and on and talk to you about commerce all day long, but there's a reason to this madness. And that is that when you bring all of these different bureaus together, it's all undergirds how we connect and build economic development. I also failed to say commerce is the Census Bureau. And census is critical because census is telling us not only who and where are people living, but also where are they moving to? Where do we need to have that predictive analytics of where do we need to make sure that we're making those investments? So census is an incredible bureau that gives us the data and tells us who lives where and how and what, what's the demographic? And that for us is essential. So EDA, let me go back to EDA. So the Economic Development Administration is the only federal agency whose sole mission is truly to talk to focus on economic development. And I told you that I wanna do two, three things. One is to tell you who we are, tell you what we do, how we do it. And then I have a big ask, is I have a big ask. I'm a, I'm a bit of a New Yorker here. And that ask is reauthorization. So I'll, I'll talk about reauthorization in a minute. So EDA was created in 1965, again, as the only agency that's focused on economic development. And right now in April, once uh, the Biden administration um, uh, took over, we changed our investment priorities. And, that invest, and those investment priorities are led by equity we realized that we needed to make sure that equity was at the center of how we drove our investments. So we'll talk more about equity in a minute, but I also wanted to let you know that our annual appropriations have usually hovered around $300 million. Because of supplementals of natural disasters, the CARES Act took EDA from $300 million to $1.5 billion. We had a series of natural disasters, the intensity of these natural disasters, the impact, and we get activated, as they say, by FEMA to come in and help communities jumpstart their economic base again after a natural disaster. Then came the American Rescue Plan, COVID. How did, how um, brought uh, idea, um, the dollars to help communities come back from uh, the COVID pandemic? That brought EDA to a $3 billion budget. 
That was a big task and it still is a big task, but I have to tell you EDA was ready for that challenge because it wasn't a, really a challenge, it was an opportunity. The opportunity was to be able to design six different grants, different grants that we had to push out within one year. So our marquee grant is the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. And that's a $1 billion grant. We received 529 applications. Now the secret sauce of, this, of these grants was, was really the partnership. And I have to tell you that at least 80% of those grants came from rural America. It was bringing together what we call regional economic development, right? There are no, we, we allowed the applicants to define what they believe is their regions. Could be across counties, across states, but really looking at regional economic development. The biggest challenge we had was to bring 529 applications to 60 finalists. We announced those 60 finalists uh, in, in uh, December. And now we're working with those 60 finalists to announce the, the awardees, which will be somewhere between 20 to 30. But what that showed us is that not only is there a need, there's a huge innovation hunger out there to get the, these dollars and really bring in opportunities in all corners of America. The second big grant was the Good Jobs Challenge. And that was $500 million. And we received 509 applications. Again, it's telling us that not only is there a need, but there's a, a, an understanding that we need to make sure that when we talk about workforce development, we're not talking about workforce development in terms of the models of the 1960s, but that we're talking about workforce development from a much more comprehensive and partnership-driven model where you have community colleges and universities and you have labor, but you also have employer commitment so that we're making sure that our employee, employees are being upskilled for the jobs of today, but also for the jobs of tomorrow. We also made a $100 million commitment for rural communities. We have a $300 million commitment for um, coal communities. So when we go down the list, these dollars really is not just to make sure that communities are weathering the pandemic, but also repositioning them and seeding uh, opportunities for what is coming down the pike. Now, let me transition a bit to broadband. Um, and this is where my, the rebel in me is gonna come out and I'm trying to tame it, but it's impossible. Broadband. The pandemic told us the communities that had not only access to internet, but the speed of internet. Some communities had internet, but the speed was so slow that it was almost not effective. This opportunity to have uh, $48 billion pushed out to, for broadband is truly unique. But here's where I think your voices are going to be incredibly important. My colleagues at NTIA are doing an incredible job. But much of those dollars are going to go to the states, as Matt was mentioning, in block grants. And much of those dollars are going to go to the states in formulas that are going to rest on FCC maps. And I hope, Matt, that um, in later conversations, you're going to be dealing with some of those maps. Now, here's what I'll tell you, some of those maps are not that very accurate. They're not reflecting your communities. They're not reflecting underserved communities. So all I'm saying is, I think your voices are going to be critical in how these maps, hopefully very soon, will be updated and how you all use your voices to make sure that your communities are reflected. Because again, when you're dealing with formulas, you want to make sure that those, those numbers are going to be flowing into your communities. So I'll stop there before I get into any more trouble. But it's important that I, as a, as a, as a public servant, not only continue to raise this issue, because this is a one-time in a generation opportunity. And if there's a flaw in the formulas, you all need to not only know, 
But this is what a democracy is all about, for you to raise those concerns and advocate. Let me pivot one more time. And this time I'm gonna to pivot to the fact that the American Rescue Plan continues to provide EDA with that opportunity of uh, making these critical investments. But we do the work that sometimes is unseen, whether it's water treatment, whether it's uh, water pipes or sewage pipes, redeveloping the downtowns, making sure that we're building um, entrepreneurship hubs, working with minority businesses, um, revolving loan funds. We have perhaps the most unique um, set of tools, which is our funding is very flexible. So if you haven't engaged with EDA, I truly encourage you. We work with you in everything from planning, pre-development. We work with um, uh, economic development districts across the country. We also work with you very closely in what's called comprehensive economic development strategies. How many of you have ever been involved in, in, in creating SEDs? Perfect. Why are the SEDs important? The SEDs are important because those are the, the, the opportunities that you have to inject your ideas, your planning up priorities. And we focus on those SEDs as an opportunity to also drive our investments. So if you haven't been part of a SED formulation, I encourage you and I invite you to be part of that. That sets the tone of how your communities are looking towards the future. So I'm excited about not only being part of this conversation, I hope that we can continue to have this relationship because at the end of the day, and as I started out, we are truly the architects of what economic development is going to be. And I would like to look back 20 years from now and say, together, we really not only were able to draw the arc of the future for our communities, but, not, but we also leveraged these dollars. Let me end with a couple of things. First of all, reauthorization. Why is reauthorization important? One is because EDA has not been reauthorized in 17 years. That's a long time. If you think about it, EDA um, was last reauthorized in 2004. The tools that we have date back to 2004. And if you know anything, you probably had more beepers than you do uh, iPhones back then. That's the same thing that we're dealing with. We have tools that are not up to date with how we address economic development in 2022. And why is that important? It's important for two reasons. One is EDA's investments are driven by how we measure distress. And, and that um, measurement of distress in turn um, will dictate what the match is. So for every dollar that EDA puts uh, into an investment, there's a required match. But the match can fluctuate up or down depending on the levels of distress. So it's our goal to make sure that we are able to go a bit more granular in how we measure distress so that in particular rural communities, which sometimes do not have the funding to make the match, are able to have more breathing room, more flexibility. We're asking Congress to help us reauthorize to give us that flexibility so that we can work more closely with you, so that we can make sure that those matching dollars, which sometimes can come from the private sector, hint, hint from our sponsors here at the table, but sometimes they're hard to come about so that EDA can have that discretion to go up and down and be able to work with you. So distress is a, a, a big component of our reauthorization. The other component of our reauthorization is disaster recovery. We know that these disasters are going to unfortunately continue to happen. Sometimes we're in the supplemental, sometimes we're not. We wanna make sure that EDA is much more stable in what it does and how it does it, so that we have some consistency in the work uh, in natural disasters. I can go on and on, but you, you get the gist. Economic development, I would like to continue to advocate for the United States should not be a $300 million budget. Economic development for the US needs to be a much bigger budget. It needs to be not episodic or a one-time shot. It needs to be consistent. 
So as we think about reauthorization, as we think about what we're doing with the American Rescue Plan, we're also making the argument that in order for us to really lift up, lift up communities, we have to have a long game. What is that long game for economic development? So let me end with that. What I will tell you is, and my colleague Courtney will tell us, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of commitment, not just interest, but commitment to rural America. We are involved in, in, and engage in interagency policy councils on rural prosperity. It's, it's a whole of government effort, um, agencies from led by USDA, but then every other agency, whether it's transportation, energy, um, Department of Commerce, Department of Labor, Department of Education, we're all at the table looking at how are we going to lift up and really drive rural prosperity. So I want you to know that this is not a one-off. This is not just a rural risk opportunity and, and, and engagement. This is something that is happening in the federal government consistently because it is something that is very important to President Biden. So I'll end with that. And I know that we have some Q&A, so I'm ready for any questions that you have. And thank you for not only the work that you do on the ground, but for your commitment and your trust in government and in public service. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. This is, uh, uh, for those remotely, this is Matt Joseph, Senior Vice President Policy for LISC. And uh, just thank you for those, those great remarks. And uh, I wanna, really wanna uplift your point about the reauthorization. It is so critical that we get that done, that this program be funded at the billions levels of years and not, not uh, billion annual funding and not uh, hundreds of millions. Um, I wanted to just ask the first question and you referenced it briefly at the beginning of your comments that there's, you, the EDA came out with a new list of priorities for investments and top on that list was equity. And I'm just, in which we were really happy to see. And I'm just curious, how is that being operationalized? How are you kind of uh, putting that into your practices for your, for your programs? So Matt, that's a, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. A couple of things. So it's not just equity in terms of a word that's in our, uh, listed in our investment priority. It was baked in or weaved into each of the notice of funding opportunities for the American Rescue Plan. Um, we made sure that there's an equity component into each of the grants that I, that I mentioned, all six of them. Um, as I mentioned, when we measure distress, we're measuring distress so that we can also look at what is the um, uh, equity component and how we fund um, that, that um, area. There's also an equity um, element to how we're collecting data. Um, one of the things that we're doing is really standing up an entire data operation at EDA to make sure that we're measuring equity at a more granular level. Um, so that's, a, that's another thing. And then also strengthening our economic development um, districts and, and our relationship there so that we are well represented across the country. So there's a lot of things that are being operationalized. Um, it is a, a verb and it is a constant um, exercise. So equity, again, as I mentioned, we don't do things in an episodic way. We, we're trying to do things and really integrate it into everything that EDA is doing. It is of personal interest to me, but I know that it is of great importance to the Bureau as a whole. And as you all know, for President Biden, it was among the first things that he um, issued in terms of the executive order um, on equity, not just for the federal government, but all the different programs that we're, that we're leading. Any other questions, comments? Everybody, I'm sure you have had some coffee at this point. I have one question. Actually, yes. this is a, a follow-up to Matt's earlier point on, on equity. And um, really, this goes, in, and thank you so much for your, your brilliant presentation. Um, we, we talk a lot about equity in a variety of different contexts, but this is more about geographic equity, mm -hmm. uh, especially given the audience of rural and very much rural in nature. And you had mentioned earlier about EDA's commitment to disaster assistance and resilience. And I would love to hear you share the, the vision and, and the strategy for really assisting rural communities that are disproportionately impacted after natural disasters. I come from a state, Louisiana, that you know is, is hit repeatedly mm -hmm. by both natural and economic disasters. Um, so we'd love to hear what, uh, what's on the horizon for EDA when it comes to this. And thank you for that. Um, 
couple of things. First of all, just travel to, um, to New Orleans, just travel to Puerto Rico, Kentucky. You're absolutely right. When you travel the country, there is one or another type of natural disaster that is on the horizon for communities. Tornadoes, hurricanes, droughts, fires, mudslides. It is so top of mind for us that when we're talking about economic development, we have to speak about resiliency. And that is one of our um, investment priorities as well. What's on the horizon? First of all, is to really build a deeper bench when it comes to how to serve communities after a natural disaster. And that's not just on the emergency side, that's on the long-term recovery side. Um, that could mean many different things. Um, when you talk about rural communities, we're talking about making sure that both on the uh, rebuilding, that we're rebuilding in a very um, resilient way, new building structures or, or methods, um, but on the economic side, that we're also looking at how to best diversify. Um, if, there's, if, it's, if it's too concentrated in one particular area, how do we bring in different types of either industries or technologies or other sources that could bring about a much more diverse economic uh, landscape for those areas? Because what we've noticed is that when you're too reliant on one particular industry, a natural disaster will definitely um, um, destroy the entire economic fabric of that community. Is this something that you do in, in, in one month? No, it's something that has to be planned out. Hence why, again, the economic planning grants that we have, some, uh, the work that we do in pre-development is going to be important. Um, the, the combination of working with the SEDS is important. Um, at the agency, at the Bureau itself, when we talk about reauthorization, we also are looking at making sure that it is one of the core elements of EDA. Because again, as I've said before, we get called in in different situations by FEMA. EDA wants to have a bit more of a, of a more stable uh, relationship as well as role in natural disaster recovery. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is that we have now staff focused on rural as well as in, in various commu um, communities, whether it's indigenous communities, rural communities, that are the key individuals driving a lot of the internal policy and programmatic agenda for, for the agency. Yeah. Question, comment, Mr. Rios. Well, first of all, thank you for your comments. I was uh, reading a little bit more about you since you're at this table. I thought I'd learn a little more and uh, learned about your upbringing in New York. And I just always marvel at, you know, this, Young girl, woman, New York, lighted communities now doing what you're doing. Just amazing. Congratulations on that. Thank you. It's, thank you. Let me and ask. And thank you for the young. I didn't <laughs> really apply, but I'll take it. <laughs> let me ask you, uh, what, what can you say about our native communities? You know, I, 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 uh, I, think, I think maybe everybody in this room and many, many others maybe listening in are worried about, you know, what these dollars coming down from federal, you know, communities in persistent poverty regions, native lands, uh, native people, well, they get left out. Uh, that's, you know, what your comments on that. And then secondly, what can philanthropy do? We don't, you know, not in the billions of dollars, but in the lesser dollars, what, what can philanthropy do to help these communities not be left behind, especially our native, uh, our Indian, Indian country? Thank you, thank you. That's an incredibly um, excellent question. A couple of things. One is um, we set aside um, $100 million for indigenous communities. But before we did that, we had uh, various consultations with um, tribal communities. Because again, doing work with the federal government is not for the faint of heart. So we recognize that we needed to make sure that we met that's our motto, we meet communities where they're at. So one of the things that the, the tribal consultation rendered was that we needed to tweak some of the uh, policies. So we changed the policies that EDA has to be able to do work, not just with tribal communities, nonprofits, but even with for-profit entities that are doing work in furtherance of the, the, the tribe. 
um, because we recognize that those um, stakeholders, one, had more capacity, and two, were still very committed and involved in the benefit of the, of the tribe. That made a big difference. The second thing we saw, we, we saw was that in the $100 million, we actually were oversubscribed. We, we, we received 2.2 times the number of applications. So yet again, this fallacy that tribal communities are not interested or they don't have the resources to apply, that was put to rest. No, there is definitely interest and capacity. We now need to continue to advocate for more dollars to go to tribal communities. And that is something that we, we will definitely continue to do. Um, being left behind, that is something that I think as public servants, we carry every day, making sure that no community is left behind because um, as, you, as you said in your remarks, it's a very big country. The resources need to flow. We need advocates like you to work with us to make sure that it is uninterrupted, that the resources can flow uninterruptedly. And that we, when we find some snags in the process, that we are able to course correct, right? For government, it's hard to course, course correct, but it is possible. So I'd wanna invite you to, to think about that. And then your question about philanthropy, you know, I, I worked in nonprofit and, and I worked with philanthropy a lot. Um, we are engaging philanthropy on two folds. One is we have projects that are shovel ready, if you will, to use a tired term, where philanthropy can actually pick up and fund. The second part philanthropy can do is, remember that match that I mentioned? Philanthropy could actually be that matching component, particularly for indigenous and rural communities. So that when they come to EDA, they're able to come in with 20% of the match. That facilitates the engagement. So there is definitely a role for philanthropy. And I know that philanthropy is sitting on $1.3 trillion. So we need to nudge philanthropy as well. Um, that's the rebel in me, my apologies. But I just think that there's, look, there's a role for all of us to play. This is an incredible moment to really think big and to be as creative and, and as innovative. People on the ground are hungry. They have the ideas. We just need to be the facilitators. And to the best of our ability, that's what EDA wants to do. So thank you for the question. Good. Thank you. Okay, it's me again. So, and thank you, Administrator Castile, for those comments. We appreciate you being here. So our next panel today brings together some of Corporate America's great minds. We have a pair of women leaders who are helping to nurture community-based broadband efforts. Um, both of these leaders have been uh, responsible for seeding some of the initial broadband work of rural LISC, and we're very grateful to both of them. So joining me now, I believe virtually both people um, to discuss these efforts is Jasmine Thomas of the Microsoft Airban and Lynette Bell of the Truist Foundation. And I'll thank both of them for joining me. How are we gonna do this, guys? While they bring them up, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them, give you a little short biography on each. So Lynette Bell is the president of Truist Foundation, an organization that's committed to collaborating with innovative companies that invest in communities to build better lives. Lynette is responsible for strategic philanthropy, deepening partnerships, there she is, with uh, nonprofits and strengthening local communities in the areas of leadership development, economic mobility, and educational equity. In her more than 30 year career with uh, SunTrust, now Truist, uh, Lynette has held multiple leadership positions ranging from operations, regulatory affairs, and compliance to now overseeing the foundation and its investments aimed at seeding innovative community development solutions. So welcome Lynette. There she is. Okay, so Jasmine, Jasmine Thomas 
is the Senior Director of Airban Initiative for Microsoft. The Airban Initiative aims to close the digital divide by bringing high-speed internet connectivity to unconnected communities. In this position, Jasmine works to invest in the infrastructure needed to help rural people and places realize new possibilities and get connected. At Airban, Jasmine works to oversee fund, develop, fund deployment and works to solution for complex business and community challenge. Welcome, Jasmine. Thank you. All right, this little odd angle that I've got here going on. So um, as we, can you, can you two ladies hear me? Yes. Can we hear you? Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. We've got everybody. We've got a winner here. So go ahead and get started. Um, first, you know, just a little bit of, uh, of background. Jasmine, I'm going to start with you. Um, in the last two years of the global pandemic magnified the disparities that exist in rural America around broadband. I mentioned it in my earlier comments. 35 percent of rural America, that is a huge number, lacks broadband speeds, and many communities are still struggling to uh, have reliable and affordable services. Um, and I know that many people might not be familiar with the Microsoft Airband Initiative. So can you discuss some of your work in this space and how Airband is um, trying to solve for connectivity challenges in rural America? Sure, and thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all and sorry that I'm not in the room. Uh, it's very busy here in DC today, but it's a great opportunity to talk about our work um, with such a great panelist um, in Lynette. So at Microsoft, we launched a five-year commitment in 2017, realizing that at the end of the day, broadband is a critical solution for connecting communities, not just for economic opportunity, but just embedding how we can advance our own daily quality of life. Life. And so that focus was a rural focus and a commitment to connect uh, through supporting internet service providers, typically mom and pop shops um, that are working to deploy uh, access for communities. Um, the goal for us was 3 million people under coverage in rural America by July 2022. Happy to say that we're going to beat that number and, and do more. I'm happy to say that we're going to beat that number, but not happy that the issue is still so prevalent and critical for communities. Um, and as we go into the pandemic, and you shared some of the numbers that really just highlighted what we already knew, and that is that millions of families across the country, whether they be in rural communities or unserved communities, just don't have access. By our um, data points, I believe we report at least 120 million million people in America aren't using broadband at broadband speeds. And so our goal is to really close that digital divide, focusing both an urban and a rural strategy, but realizing that we can gain wonderful lessons in how to provide support for families to really not just get them access to broadband, but to connect them through digital skills, making sure jobs stay local and the skills are there in communities so that people don't have to leave for work. Um, and we have a number of programs really designed around that. Um, initially, our corporate strategy around growing home, and that is ensuring that we provide a full end of digital services in communities in partnership with local nonprofits and others. The other piece of that is making sure that we have access to affordable devices. And we're really excited that the new federal conversation is around driving digital equity, not just broadband infrastructure, but really bringing all of that together. And we're just pleased for that opportunity to advance transformation. And I'm sure there's going to be another follow-up question perhaps on what that could look like in rural America. And we've got some great examples. Um, but I really think for us right now, it's leaning into this moment, making sure that we're preparing nonprofits to provide support to the community as more families are adopting broadband, but also being strategic strategic about our collaborations and alliances to expand and maximize the amount of resources available um, to support greater connectivity in communities across the country, particularly in rural America. Great. So Jasmine, just to follow up on that, you talk about partnerships um, with nonprofits and uh, what a big role they play in these solutions. Um, and I know that you're busy fostering a number of these relationships. What do you think is required to organize uh, partnerships uh, through a network throughout the country? And where do you see CDFIs uh, playing a role? 
that is a fabulous question. So I happen to be a proud board member of a CDFI um, based out of Oakland, because communi uh, Pacific Community Ventures. And one of the things that I'm really excited about is a new conversation around how we can deploy capital differently, perhaps, particularly in the broadband space. I'm excited about uh, some of the conversations I've been having in Appalachia and in the South around this. Um, what's needed? There's a couple of things. And, and I love the fact that, you know, the question is very innovative in that it combines what I think could be three separate talks. Um, but let me try to just offer some um, thoughts at a high level. First is, you know, after almost 20 years doing this work and doing it in community foundations, private philanthropy, as well as corporate, we need to provide community nonprofits with capacity. So they need the capacity and the support and the flexibility not to just implement what funders are giving them, but actually adapt it to the markets in which they work, giving them that room and that flexibility is key. Um, the other thing is, how do we better share and network nonprofits together? They don't need to do everything, but how do we support them to really, if you will, live their best life at their level and expand their ability to do more of their business model that makes sense, rather than trying to do too much at one time. And I think we in corporate giving have um, often led organizations astray. And I want to just say, as we lean in right now, um, I'm grateful for the fact that broadband is touching every human service and social service organization from, you know, education focused groups, as well as arts and others groups. So how do we provide their ability to do more in their, the, the way that they want to grow? The other piece I would say is collaborating with other donors. We often don't spend a lot of time aligning ourselves with how we can leverage capital differently. So I, I heard a lot of what um, Alejandra said earlier. Um, she's absolutely right um, that we need to think strategically about um, what's the role that our resources could provide in, in a being in a catalytic um, kind of funding mechanism, and then making sure that we're complementing each other rather than cannibalizing investments that are available. Great. Thanks, Jasmine. Sure. So Lynette, let's talk about fostering partnerships with you. So foundations have been at the forefront um, of helping seed much of the work, the early work that's been done to improve broadband access. And I know Truist in particular has been a leader in this space. You've invested millions to, um, to make an impact in this area. So my question is why financial institutions like Truist are so committed to strengthening the broadband access in the rural community? Um, so, you know, why exactly has Truist chosen to go all in in this space? Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm so excited to be on this panel. And thank you, Lisa, for the question um, with Jasmine. I think Jasmine hit the nail on the head when she talks about collaboration. And I think when you look at this ecosystem of making sure that everyone has that equal access, we believe that the elimination of the digital divide is the only way to provide opportunities for generational wealth. You know, we at the foundation, at Truist Foundation, started working on strategic directions. And one of the things that was clearly identified from the pandemic and the racial justice movement is that, you know, systems of inequity exist today, but not having access to the capability to go online and apply for a job or to change your business model during a pandemic, going from a face-to-face -face business model to one that is all virtual, broadband was at the center of that. And so with that in mind, we know that we have to provide grants to organizations that help strengthen small businesses and accept building career pathways so people have the ability to increase their economic mobility or build mobility for them, their families. And so broadband is at the center and core of this. It is a crucial part of what industries need in order to grow and thrive. And so we're working to kind of uphold that principle of justice-centered philanthropy at Truist by making sure that we create a priority for BIPOC communities being transparent in how we give and using our online open application process so that we can leverage our resources to empower those most familiar with the needs on the ground in a community to address those challenges and implement solutions to do that real critical work. We know that broadband is at the center. If you don't have access to you know, the internet or it's the ability to connect, it really impedes your ability to grow. And so we know that as ourselves, we wanna be a disruptor in this force, driving that kind of transformational equity in this industry. So corporations and private family foundations are all looking at this as well as the federal government on how do we tackle this particular challenge. 
Thanks, Lynette. So just a follow up question for that. So as I said, you, you've been at the forefront of some of the funding for Digital Navigator for some pre-development work. As you look around the corner to what's coming up next, uh, what role do you think banks like Truist are going to play in, in the next steps towards these investments? And what types of partnerships do you see needed in the future? Yeah, I really see the, Alejandro talked about this too, as well as Jasmine, the collaboration has to happen. We got to build that connective tissue across these verticals that we're all working in trying to address this inequity. And I think that nonprofit community-based organizations or even CDFIs who are moving in this space to really help you know, <laughs> navigate in this space to eliminate the inequity are what we need to do. So the collaboration, and so they're gonna be, the federal government can provide funding for this. I think they provided you know, 62 billion or whatever it is. It's only gonna get to about 30% of the people who don't have broadband. We're gonna need other partnerships and collaborations to really address and move this needle on how do we get access across this country, particularly in rural markets. And so that collaboration is needed. I'm really looking at CDFIs who are innovators in this space, who are trying to make sure that they build the right resources and tools um, to help address these systemic issues. Thanks, Lynette. So let's talk a little bit about capital and resources. So Jasmine, so with the passage of the, of the infrastructure bill that we've talked about here today and, and billions of dollars flowing into states and local communities for broadband investment, um, there's going to be opportunities for, uh, you know, corporate America, local communities um, to connect to take advantage of the, those resources. Um, you know, what do you think about those connections and how should um, communities think about navigating those investment opportunities with their corporate partners? I'm so glad you asked that. And I'm going to double click on um, kind of that navigation process. So um, it's moving fast. So, and I'm sure Lynette is feeling it too. Um, I think there's a few things. One is we still have some, you know, need to get the resources that were allocated during the pandemic still to the ground. So that is still an effort through particularly ARPA dollars um, and as well as RDOF dollars. Still, we're waiting for broadband providers to be able to kind of deploy um, and continue to cover the communities. And RDOF means the Rural Development Opportunity Fund. So the funding that would go to more broadband deployments in communities, we're still waiting for those announcements um, and, and decisions coming forth. Um, so as we're looking at three different funding sources, um, one for recovery, one for rural communities, but also um, one for um, IIJA funds, we're watching in real time how states are actually leaning in further and they're adding not just federal dollars, not, not just their own dollars, but also state and local dollars to the federal funds that are available to them. They're setting up broadband offices. And so the question for us is how are we, and we like to steal some lines that we've heard from others, you know, why reinvent the wheel? why not get into the friend zone with state broadband officers and figure out how are they thinking about providing support to communities and particularly rural and urban communities? How do we drive digital equity, as we were to say? And so for us, digital equity literally means how do we make sure that broadband is at broadband speeds and affordable in communities with accessible digital skilling that's also supported by communities and um, at the state and local level. But how do we also make sure that we're all leaning in at the same time across sectors? How are we moving quickly to deploy access for communities, not waiting, not deploying strategies that or technologies that take years for us to make progress? Um, I, I've been spending some time in the community and particularly in the, the Mississippi Delta to understand what's happening and in the Black Belt states to understand what's going on. And one of the things that I think we need, we did was we built what's called a digital equity playbook. And that is something to document the best practices of leveraging broadband policy of the past to influence how we're thinking about it for the future. And that we hope becomes a guide for how states and nonprofits can actually lean in and take a look at um, partnering and collaborating together. The other thing that I'm excited about is in the next week or so, we're gonna be launching a new data dashboard. It's called a digital equity data dashboard. I know, cute name pretty straightforward. It overlays accessibility, what's happening now in the community, as well as overlaying affordability, overlaying access, as well as income, as well as um, education and who's in those communities. So as we talk about broadband, the question is, 
navigating for who? How are we leaning in and to support those communities? And what do they look like? How do we make sure that they have the access that they need to thrive? And so I'm happy to share that as a follow-up. So for us at Microsoft, it really is leaning in with the data. It really is collaborating across sectors and finding alignment in areas to kind of communicate and lead together. And the third is documenting those best practices and tracking our progress. And so for us, I think that is um, a critical notion that we all at least we have a few years to get this right. And I'm really excited about the fact that you, we're talking about this with rural risk in the, in the sense of how are we thinking about policy, marrying it with practice that we know is effective, but also how do we lean in with respect to fun, the funding piece, which is gonna be huge. I mean, Lynette made that great point. When you cut up $62 billion, $62 billion is not a lot of money across 50 states. Um, and there's so much that's needed to build the capacity to really absorb that capital, as well as um, expand to actually cover as many people as possible. I think the data shows that there's still millions of people that would be, you know, uncovered at that point, even if we just deployed what we had. So the, the question for us is, how are we going to maximize the limited resources we have? And what are those tools that we need to make um, or to put forth to build the case? of being equitable in our approach. Great, great answer. So Lynette, let me ask you this. How do you think, as far as capital is concerned, how do you think that the CDFIs and the financial community can best assist in helping to leverage that, uh, the public and private broadband investments that are being made in rural America? Yeah, I think CDFIs are uniquely positioned and it's a great question, a great push. I think one of the things that they do understand really clearly is what impact is needed on the ground to have effective change. And so when we talk about social impact investing and really making a difference in our communities, CDFIs are uniquely positioned, and I'll state it again, to change and make, become part of that change agent. They're the innovators. And so by being so close to the ground, in many cases, they have the clear relationship, but understand the challenge, right? And uh, the pieces of statewide or federal funding that's available, but also needed is how do we help continue to co-create with other partners? And so they understand collaboration better than anybody and have the ability to build those relationships and partnerships. So they'll leverage what is on the federal side of the house, you know, by making sure they build that connectivity, but they'll also engage that private sector. So they, to me, are the perfect conduit to one, analyze clearly what's on the ground, but also to try to move it forward so that we start driving real impactful numbers. Great, thanks. Let's talk a little bit about um, digital skilling. Um, and I'll start with Lynette this time. So Lynette, you know, we've talked a lot about brown bad co connectivity, but digital skilling is equally important, um, especially as we are definitely becoming a more online society, right? I don't know the last time I walked into a branch bank, I do everything on my phone. So banking in particular is moving online and digital on the phone. What do you think some of the greatest challenges are to online banking in rural America? Um, and how do you think this might impact a community's ability to access capital and resources? Yeah, that's a great question, a great push. Um, I will say in this digital age that we find ourselves in, access to broadband technology is a basic human right. And low to moderate income families, rural residents and communities of colors are really being left behind. But with that said, the digital skills are also lagging. You know, I'll speak clearly about my 83-year-old mother who, God bless her, has her banking app. And of course, she can do her thumbprint. And now they took the thumbprint away. And she's like, I can't get to my bank account. And so that's really fun for me every day trying to help her read her bank statement. <laughs> but one of the things that I will say that we got to get communities. And again, it's an ageism thing, too. When you look at communities of color, like how do you get seniors really to utilize systems and processes so that they can stay abreast of change that is happening. At the Truist Foundation, one of the things that we did, we talked, we've talked a lot and Jasmine's talked about collaboration and how do people do really assess the needs that are on the ground. One of the things that we did was talk about co-creating initiative with a nonprofit organization, providing $10 million to establish a partnership with Connect Humanity. And they aim to help eliminate that digital divide between individuals who have access to this new technology and those who are being left behind with the lack of affordable access to broadband and digital. And so they're creating these connections around communities, particularly in rural communities, because as we look at the maps about the most disconnected cities in the US, 
it was clear a lot of them are in the Southeast, highly urban, I mean, highly urban or highly rural. And so one of the things that this grant will provide is improve that connectivity for at least 5 million historically underserved um, Americans across the country. It will spur roughly about $500 million in economic opportunity, creating over a thousand network engineering and maintenance jobs. So not only is it increasing the broadband access, but it's also providing that digital economic mobility that's needed to help people move out of their current situation, earning the living wage and prop helping them to build some generational wealth for themselves. So we know that organizations and nonprofits like that are who we're looking at because we want those innovators to come forward with those great ideas because as Jasmine illustrated, the federal dollars are not gonna go very far. You're gonna have to have partnerships with other organizations that are community-based and led um, that are doing some of this very difficult work. Oh, great. So Jasmine, I know that you've spent a lot of your time thinking about the partnerships and the physical infrastructure that's needed to strengthen our rural connectivity, but let's talk again about the human infrastructure and the skills that are needed to adapt to uh, online uh, capabilities. So how does Microsoft view people investments and what do you think is needed in rural America from a human investment perspective as we work to move our daily practices online? Yeah, and thank you for that question because it actually brought me um, into Microsoft uh, to take this role. Um, so I joined in, in late September after 10 years of, you know, what Lynette shared around the banking space. Um, she and I have uh, a similar background. And I, I'm so excited that the collaboration with financial institutions and other corporates um, could really be brought to bear in this broadband conversation. Um, so at Microsoft, what's exciting is we're leaning in, and, and when I say leaning in, I mean all of us are really looking at how broadband is a thread. So Microsoft's mission, straightforward, empowering every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. That's literally the mission. So everything we do is about how do we help people be more, achieve more, do more of what they want to do, using technology as the thread. And so if I look at what the Airband Initiative does in our Tech for Corporate Responsibility team, we really are the foundational piece of the work. We collaborate, as I said, across a continuum of what we mean by digital equity with our colleagues in Microsoft Philanthropies, the actual foundation of Microsoft, to help drive that, making sure that as we're funding and supporting the connectivity, the digital literacy and the digital skilling to do the types of things that Lynette shared, really expanding people's ability to conduct their basic transactions in their daily lives. We're also working with our philanthropies team to support their efforts, which really is around cyber skilling and making sure that we've got a workforce that's ready to address the challenge of what we know we will need to address, and that is cybersecurity. So partnering with community colleges, the American Community College Association, to drive a curriculum that, you know, is a competitive process, making sure that community colleges have the ability to provide that service, that training in community, right? You shouldn't have to leave your neighborhood, rural America or not, um, to actually find uh, meaningful work. And as Lynette said, this is all about generational wealth building, right? It's all about economic mobility and economic competitiveness. And so working with that philanthropy team, we're, we're kind of like a piece of a continuum of how Microsoft sees this work. And then we also partner with our colleagues in justice reform to look at how technology can play a role in advancing the engagement of communities, their civic engagement um, through our Democracy Forward team, or accessibility of communities and technology with our accessibility team. So, or university relations, building the technology uh, strength of HBCUs or historically black community college, historically black colleges and universities, as well as Latinx uh, historically serving institutions, making sure that all of those schools can compete and bring in uh, technology as a core. We were watching still today where young people can't go to school, college, because they don't have the connectivity or they don't have the access they need to work, you know, in a virtual or a hybrid environment. And so how do we at least at Microsoft, look across that continuum using broadband as the thread and feed into the mission and the values of the institution and find aligned partners who have the ability to take things to a whole nother level with us. Not that we go it alone, but absolutely how we 
bring it all together and make it make broadband um, and digital technology at scale as center plate of our conversation. What's great is now's the time to do so. And I'm just happy to be a part of the team to, to bring in what I know about the financial world, but then also say, you know, what does it take for us to um, actually be able to deliver on our goals of closing that gap in the next few years? Good, Good. thank you. So I think we'll go to a little Q&A now. Yes, all right. Caitlin? We have some questions from the virtual audience and then also encourage the, the audience present here to come up and ask any questions that you may have for the panelists. But first question is directed to you, Jasmine. I see from your bio that Pacific Community Ventures has a social impact fund. Can you please share the social ROI metrics and how it's related to digital equity? Ooh. So we're having that conversation in real time about the digital equity piece. Um, and I, I, that is something that I don't want to get ahead of my colleagues um, at PCV to have that conversation. But I would say I love the fact that, you know, Lisa's question was around human capital. Like, how are we investing and thinking about people at the center of all of this? Um, what's exciting for me is that the work that is at, underway at PCV, which is a CDFI, is putting people at the center, making sure that uh, quality jobs, quality wages are a part of the types of transactions and the funding that's happening um, at PCV for the community. The other thing I'm super excited about is that you know, I tend to be a part of institutions that don't want to go it alone, but they want to build the capacity of others in this space. And so when you look at the, the gap in access to capital, particularly in rural communities, what's exciting is that they're leaning in to say, um, how do we bring them into best practices, models that work, but also give them the capacity to, imp to implement in communities in ways that work for them and deploy capital in ways that work for them and make sure that the human-centered approach, not just in access to the capital, but also who the beneficiaries are and how that transforms the economics of the business and of the community. Again, wages, jobs, that is all exciting to me because I think as we're thinking about social return and return on investment, we have an opportunity to, to redefine and to be very clear about putting that stake in the ground about what good investments look like. And so I'm just pleased to see how we can take that to a whole nother level. Go ahead. I, I, uh, this is uh, Kellen Butts with at and Jasmine, uh, it's not really a question, but uh, we looks like we're going to be doing some work together. So I want to say kudos to you for, for really pushing us uh, to, to, to look at doing some, some work with you. So I don't know if you want to talk about what we're thinking about it all yet, because we haven't really gotten there too deeply, but just know hopefully maybe by next year this time, maybe we'll something but I just want to say hello and just like vouch for her when she's saying she's really trying to work with uh with others uh I I, I can vouch for that so thank you no, validation is always helpful. Um, after almost 20 years in corporate ph uh, philanthropy, I know to not say anything until the ink is dry. So but I'm I, to your point, super excited about again, opening the door for collaboration across the sector. We can't do this without figuring out how we leverage the best aspects of ourselves of, as an institutions to really make the change we wanna see in communities. Again, I, I guess for, for me professionally, I just feel like we have a few years to really lay some good ground and foundations for how we can move forward um, and what that forward looks like and whether it'll be inclusive whether it'll be empowering and whether it'll enable people to compete on even footing. And I think that's where um, the conversation now is in our lap to kind of uh, partner across sectors to make sure it works out. Kate, are there more questions? Oh, good. Tim? Uh, this question is for Lynette. Uh, Lynette, thank you. Uh, great to hear. I, Looking forward to meeting you at some point and congratulations uh, to Truist, uh, another bank foundation for doing the right thing. L let me ask you, uh, you know, there's for philanthropy, especially bank philanthropy, there's a thousand things that we can invest in. And you selected to put $10 million into an organization to do this. Can you talk a little bit about the, 
the blueprint within your organization, why you did it, how you did it, what you expect will come out of it. Uh, it it's, it's not sort of a logical place for a bank foundation, and I'm learning that. And I would love to hear directly from you as to how your, how your company sees it inside and the benefits and the story that, that happens inside the company. Yeah, thank you so much for the compliment. Um, we're a new, relatively new foundation after the merger of SunTrust and BB&T was approved in 2019, at the end of 2019. And so um, a lot of lessons learned from the pandemic and the social justice movement. You know, the foundation established itself and really started taking a hard look on how we were trying to invest our dollars but really talk about having long-term impact. And so what we realized based on the two new strategic pillars we created for ourselves, strengthening small businesses and career pathways to economic mobility, well, broadband is kind of like the foundation or technology access is the foundation of both of those. And I can't talk about, hey, how would I create career pathways with nonprofit organizations that are doing that work for 20 years? We just had an announcement today of a 15 point, uh, yesterday of a $15.7 million grant with Kale, again, talking about career pathways for economic mobility, but the conversation inside the house was around what is the baseline, right, to get people to the economic mobility pathway. And we realized economic mobility has a huge lots of layers to peel back. The same thing with small businesses in the pandemic, a lot of businesses were not resilient enough and 46% were in jeopardy of not reopening, particularly businesses of color, but the reason was because they didn't have the technology to take their business to and recalibrate it to a new model. Whereas the companies that did have the access and capital and got BB loans to do that, minority and BIPOC businesses did not. So we looked at broadband and technology as kind of the foundation and base of everything that we were trying to invest in going forward. So that really was the conversation. And we had a deep conversation about equity and looking at systemic issues and how do we interpret and build equitable investments for BIPOC-led organizations or to support minority and women-owned businesses. We really took that to heart. And, and I want to say take it to heart. We asked really tough questions of grantees. Who are your constituents serve? That's a common question about impact. But what is your board makeup? How diverse is your board? How diverse is your senior leadership team? The same thing with consultants and third-party vendors. The operation of this foundation is asking those same very questions because if equity is embedded in our work, then it has to be embedded in everything that we do. So I really appreciate the question, but we started kind of looking at co-creating initiatives that were springboards for the strategy we were trying to develop. And to me, technology and access is the same as the electrical movement that happened in the 40s when they had to light up the US. It's the same broad base that if you don't have electricity, you were not able to do business. And so it's the same thing for me. If you don't have broadband in today's society, you're going to be left behind. And so we have too many communities that are so disconnected. This was critical for us as part of, you know, in the innovation piece that had to happen. And we're going to continue to look for those innovators around the space as well. So thank you for that question. Thank you. And congratulations again. Thank you. I have a few more questions here. Uh, tons of sticky notes on my fingers here, so let's try to find one. So this actually comes up, uh, I think both of you actually had mentioned this earlier, a question from the audience. What should a brand new CDFI do or be doing right now to be the innovative change agent that you both referenced earlier? I just responded to it in the chat, but I can respond now. I would say it's very important that CDFIs who are brand new, assess where the market is right now. Can I also suggest technology should be a key operational goal and, and kind of uh, mechanism, but also how to bring, how to think about the CDFI in a, in a sense of the context in which it's working. So what's the landscape? Um, the other piece is um, filling the critical gaps that exist right now and understanding the role that different CDFIs are playing. What I'm learning and, you know, and I've been learning that for the last five years. So I'm, I'm grateful for Lynette's comment because she's absolutely right. During the pandemic, I was sitting in a financial institution that was trying to work with CDFIs to work with small businesses who literally were on their phones 
filling out PPP loans in their car because they got a signal outside of a store. Um, or, you know, I'm sure it happened at Truist as well. Bankers were trying to get people connected in ways that and help them provide support. So I think the question is, where do CDFIs fit into this? And I think the question earlier was a good one. The broadband discussion, where can they meaningfully add value and support and um, capacity building for small businesses to actually be able to do more e-commerce enablement? I think is gonna be critical even at the tiniest level that will be important. The other suggestion I would make is not just plan for today, but plan for the future. What's that sustainability look like? The funding strategy, um, as well as how are we how you leverage capital differently um, and for what audience and being very clear about that and where those gaps are. I think that type of analysis and planning will be fruitful in the long run. Jasmine provided a lot of great content. And the only thing I would add to her great answer is that CDFI should be looking at innovation. And when I say innovation, let's create that imagination so that you start operating your business model differently so that AI becomes a part of what and how you do your business, right? So working smarter, not harder. So we had this first pandemic happen, but we don't know what disruptions are coming in the future. And so to be prepared for what if, but using technology and innovation to grow your model, I think is the other direction you need to be going in. There's tons of innovators. And when you look at that B2B model, like where are the components of business that exist today? I think Jasmine is exactly right. Pay attention to what's happening. You know, having that social dialogue in those communities so that culture and, you know, cultural shifts are identified, but also the social impact change that's needed. You be the innovator of that change and bring that technology play forward, even on a small scale, for year one, two, but like, what is your imagination saying to you that you should do? There's a great idea that has not been created and CDFIs are at the cusp of making that happen. There are plenty of them that are already moving forward to it, but think about what you do and how can you innovate this model that you're working on to change it, to change the dynamic of it. I think that to me is what I'll add to Jasmine's comment. Jasmine, you covered it all. So, but yeah, that, that was my attitude. <laughs> your innovation was a great one because I, I was already thinking of it, you said it. So that was important. Any more? Do you want one more question or should we? Anyone? Let's go with one more question. All right. I think this one is probably best directed to you, Jasmine. Um, Alejandra had actually brought this up earlier in our conversation, talking about the, the mapping database and how the maps are not up to par. Can you talk a little bit about the Microsoft Data Dashboard and why this is so important? Sure. So everything in Microsoft as a technology firm uh, starts with data. Um, and I am overwhelmed, impressed, scared, and excited about all of it in the sense that there's so much that we could glean from how we work if we only focused on um, using it to improve our practices and improve our policy and investment strategies. Um, and so it is overwhelming. And I just tend to be scared when I just see thousands and thousands of numbers. Despite my background, I still get overwhelmed. Um, so the data dashboard was an additional approach that we took building on what exists now. And what Microsoft did was uh, we have some of our staff here in the Airband Initiative spent 20 years or more in the FCC. So they were already from a professional background leading mapping um, and, and engagement on broadband from the agency level and left to come to Microsoft and realized that we really needed better maps about what's happening in community with respect to access to broadband writ large, affordability, as well as how that difference um, kind of uh, is a, how that difference manifests itself in the face of the other data that was available out there, including federal data. And so Microsoft right now, if you look at the Microsoft Airband website, there's a Power BI application, which if you, you know, from a technology standpoint, hit the button, you'll see and play with, kind of toggle the states and, and the issue areas that impact communities with respect to broadband and digital equity. We then took another look during this conversation with the IIJ funding to say, what data is out there but hasn't been aggregated together to tell a complete story about how we should be thinking about access, 
adoption of broadband, skilling, all of that? How do we look at it? And so we realized we were missing layers of data. And so what we did with this new equity dashboard is based on our framing of digital equity, affordable access to broadband, affordable device access, skilling, um, uh, cost, all of that. If we overlay those different lenses, what does that tell us about where there are broadband gaps and where we should be focusing our investment, our time, our policy? And so this dashboard, we're hoping, and we're gonna, it's gonna go live soon on our website uh, before the end of the month. In fact, it could be the next two weeks, but everyone, it'll be open, you know, everyone will be able to see kind of how that manifests into a mapping of a framework. And we're hoping that it also empowers institutions that don't see themselves at the center of this work to really participate and to figure out how does this information then impact the service delivery model that our organization is planning? How does this impact our funding and how we reach people? I think Lynette is absolutely right. We sat in our homes, we were lucky to work from home. I was lucky for two years. But if we realize that 70% of America has to go out there and be in person to do work. We've got to figure out what are the ways in which we can help bring more people into meaningful work, into meaningful economic development, but that requires us to get the data. And that mapping for us is key. And that's where we start. My hope is that at the end, it makes the help people and organizations make those decisions, but also we're Microsoft. We're always open to additional data sources, additional elements, um, that we can put together. And all of this was led by our data science team um, and the head of data science here at Microsoft, super excited that they've leaned in. Our, our senior leadership team is really excited about it. So we look forward to sharing more and ask, answering any questions that you have, as well as hearing feedback about how the information is useful and what else is missing that we could potentially add. Excellent. Okay, well, that was a wonderful panel. So Lynette Bell, and Jasmine Thomas, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. And uh, thank I look you. forward to hearing from you again. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. Have a good one. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was a